Hello there. My name is Austin, and I'm afraid that I have to start this off with two apologies. First, my apology for not uh, getting this recording out sooner. I'm afraid life has been rather hectic. I work at multiple different uh, emergency rooms, and, uh, well, uh, things have just been a little bit crazy lately. I've been working, say, about six days a week, and normally those Sundays are spent just trying to get the house back together. Uh, additionally, I must also apologize due to the fact that I thought that there was only one chapter left, because that's how I remembered it whenever I first read the book. Ten chapters, very clean. It turns out there are twelve. I only remembered the last three as one chapter, due to the fact that they're all so short. So, I'm going to go ahead and get these three uh, taken care of for you, so that way you'll have something to listen to when you go to bed tonight. Without further ado, make sure you're tucked in, well fed, here's chapter 10. It was on the 7th of November, the eve of his own 32nd birthday, as he often remembered afterwards. He was walking home about 11 o'clock from Lord Henry's, where he had been dining and was wrapped in heavy furs, as the night was cold and foggy. At the corner of Grosvenor Square and South Audley Street, a man passed him in the mist, walking very fast with the collar of his gray ulster turned up. He had a bag in his hand. He recognized him. It was Basil Halward. A strange sense of fear for which he could not account for came over him. He made no sign of recognition and went on slowly in the direction of his own house. But Halward had seen him. Dorian heard him first stopping and then hurrying after him. In a few minutes, his hand was on his arm. Dorian! What an extraordinary piece of luck! I've been waiting for you ever since nine o'clock at your library. Finally, I took pity on your tired servant and told him to go to bed, as you let me out. Well, you see, I'm off to Paris by the midnight train, and I wanted particularly to see you before I left. I thought it was you, or rather your fur coat as you passed me, but I wasn't quite sure. Uh, do you recognize me? In this fog, my dear Basil? Well, I can't even recognize Grosvenor Square. I believe my house is somewhere about here, but I don't feel all certain about it. I'm sorry you're going away, as I've not seen you for ages, but I suppose you'll be back soon? No. I'm going to be out of England for six months. I intend to take a studio in Paris and shut myself up until I've finished the great picture that I have in my head. However, it wasn't about myself that I wanted to talk. Here we are at your door. Uh, let me come in for a moment. I have something to say to you. I shall be charmed. But won't you miss your train? said Dorian Gray languidly as he passed up the steps and opened the door with his latch key. The lamplight struggled out through the fog, and Howard looked at his watch. I have heaps of time, he answered. The train doesn't go until 12.15, and it's only just 11. In fact, I was on my way to the club to look for you when I met you. You see, I shan't have any delay about luggage, as I've sent, mine on, uh, I've sent my heavy things. All I have with me is this bag, and I can easily get to Victoria in 20 minutes. Dorian looked at him and smiled. What a way for a fashionable painter to travel. A gladstone bag and an ulster. Come in or the fog will get into the house. And mind you don't talk about anything serious. Nothing is serious nowadays. At least nothing should be. Howard shook his head as he entered and followed Dorian into the library. There was a bright wood fire blazing in the large open hearth. The lamps were lit and an open Dutch silver spirit case stood with some siphons of soda water and a large cut glass tumblers on a little table. You see, your servant made me quite at home, Dorian. He gave me everything I wanted, including your best cigarettes. He's a most hospitable creature. I like him much better than the Frenchman you used to have. What's become of the Frenchman, by the by? Dorian shrugged his shoulders. I believe he married Lady Ashton's maid and has established her in Paris as an English dressmaker. Anglomani is very fashionable over there now, I hear. It seems silly of the French, doesn't it? But... Do you know, he was not at all a bad servant. I never liked him, but I had nothing to complain about. One often imagines things that are quite absurd. He was really very devoted to me and seemed quite sorry, and I seemed quite sorry when he went away. Have another brandy and soda? Or would you like Hawk and Seltzer? I always take Hawk and Seltzer myself. There's sure to be some in the next room. Uh, thanks, I won't have anything more, said Howard, taking his cap and coat off and throwing them on the, on the bag that he had placed in the corner. 
And now, my dear fellow, I want to speak with you seriously. Don't frown like that. You make it much more difficult for me. What's it all about? cried Dorian in a petulant way, flinging himself down onto the sofa. I hope it's not about myself. I'm tired of myself tonight. I should like to be somebody else. It is about yourself, answered Howard, in his grave, deep voice. And I must say it to you. I shall only keep you for half an hour. Dorian sighed and lit a cigarette. Half an hour, he murmured. It's not much to ask of you, Dorian. It's entirely for your own sake that I'm speaking. I think it right that you should know that the most dreadful things are being said about you in London. Things that I could hardly repeat to you. I don't wish to know anything about them. I love scandals about other people, but scandals about myself don't interest me. They have not the charm of novelty. They must interest you, Dorian. Every gentleman is interested in his good name. You don't want people to talk to you as something, as something vile and degraded. Of course you have your position and your wealth and all that kind of thing. But position and wealth are not everything. Mind you, I don't believe these rumors at all. At least I can't believe them when I see you. Sin is a thing that writes itself across a man's face. It cannot be concealed. People talk of secret vices. There are no such things as secret vices. If a wretched man has a vice, it shows itself in the lines of his mouth, the droop of his eyelids, the molding of his hands even. Somebody... I won't mention his name, but you know him, came to me last year to have his portrait done. I had never seen him before and had never heard anything of him at the time, though I have heard a good deal since. He offered me an extravagant price. I refused him. There was something in the shape of his fingers that I hated. I know now that I was quite right in what I fancied about him. His life is dreadful. But you, Dorian, with your pure, bright, innocent face and your marvelous, untroubled youth, I can't believe anything against you. And yet I see you very seldom, and you never come down to the studio now, and when I'm away from you I hear all these hideous things that people are whispering about you. I don't know what to say. Why is it, Dorian, that a man like the Duke of Berwick leaves the room of the club when you enter it? Why is it that so many gentlemen in London will neither go to your house nor invite you to theirs? You used to be a friend of the Lord Cawdor. I met him at dinner last week. Your name happened to come up in conversation in connection with the miniatures that you lent to the exhibition of Dudley. Cawdor curled his lip and said that you might have the most artistic tastes, but that you were a man whom no pure-minded girl should be allowed to know, and whom no chaste woman should sit in the same room with. I reminded him that I was a friend of yours and asked him what he meant. He told me. He told me right out before everybody. It was horrible. Why is your friendship so faithful to young men? There was that wretched boy in the guards who committed suicide. You were his great friend. Uh, there was Sir Henry Ashton, who had to leave England with a tarnished name. You and he were inseparable. What about Adrian Singleton and his dreadful end? What about Lord Kent's only son and his career? I met his father yesterday at St. James Street. He seemed broken with shame and sorrow. What about the young Duke of Perth? What sort of life has he got now? What gentleman would associate with him? Dorian, Dorian, your reputation is infamous. I know you and Harry are great friends. I say nothing about that now, but surely you need not have made his sister's name a byword. When you let, met Lady Gwendolen, not a breath of scandal had ever touched her. Is there a single decent woman in London now who would drive with her in the park? Why, even her children are not allowed to live with her. Then there are other stories, stories that you have been seen creeping at dawn out of dreadful houses and slinking in disguise into the foulest dens in London. Are they true? Can they be true? When I first heard them, I laughed. I hear them now and they make me shudder. What about your country house and the life that is led there? Dorian, you don't know what is said, that, that what, what is said about you. I won't tell you that I don't want to preach to you. I remember Harry saying once that every man who turned himself to an amateur curate for the moment always said that and then broke his word. I do want to preach to you. I want you to lead such a life as will make the world respect you. I want you to have a clean name and a fair record. I want you to get rid of the dreadful people you associate with. Don't shrug your shoulders like that. Don't be so indifferent. You have a wonderful influence. Let it be for good, not for evil. They say that you corrupt everyone whom you become intimate with, and that it's quite sufficient for you to enter a house for shame of some kind to follow after you. I don't know whether it is so or not. 
How should I know? But it's said of you. I am told things that seem impossible to doubt. Lord Gloucester was one of my greatest friends at Oxford. He showed me a letter that his wife had written to him when she was dying alone in her villa at Mentone. Your name was implicated in the most terrible confession that I've ever read. I told him that it was absurd, that I knew you thoroughly, and that you were incapable of anything of the kind. Know you? I wonder, do I know you? Before I could answer that, I would have to see your soul. To see my soul, muttered Dorian Gray, starting up from the sofa and turning almost white from fear. Yes, answered Howard gravely, and with infinite sorrow in his voice. To see your soul. But only God can do that. A bitter laugh of mockery broke from the lips of the younger man. You shall see it yourself. Tonight, he cried, seizing the lamp from the table. Come, it's your own handiwork. Why shouldn't you look at it? You can tell the world all about it afterwards if you choose. No one would believe you. And if they did believe you, they'd like me all the better for it. I know the age better than you do, though you'll be prayed about it so tediously. Come, I tell you. You've chatted enough about corruption. Now you should look at face to face. There was a madness of pride in every word that he uttered. He stamped his foot upon the ground in his boyish, insolent manner. He felt a terrible joy at the thought that someone else was to share his secret, and that the man who had painted the portrait that was the origin of all his shame was to be burdened for the rest of his life with the hideous memory of what he had done. Yes, he continued, coming closer to him and looking steadfastly into his stern eyes, I will show you my soul. You shall see the thing that you fancy only God can see. Hallward started back. This is blasphemy, Dorian, he cried. You mustn't say things like that. They're horrible. They don't mean anything. You think so, he laughed again. I know so. As for what I said to you tonight, I said it for your good. You know that I've always been devoted to you. Don't touch me. Finish what you have to say. A twisted flash of pain shot across Howard's face. He paused for a moment, and a wild feeling of pity came over him. After all, what right had he to pry into the life of Dorian Gray? If he had done the tithe of what was rumored about him, how much must he have suffered? Then he straightened himself up and walked over to the fireplace and stood there, looking at the burning logs with their frost-like ashes and their throbbing cores of flame. I'm waiting, Basil said the young man in a hard, clear voice. He turned round. What I have to say is this, he cried. You must give me some answer to these horrible charges that are made against you. If you tell me that they're absolutely untrue from the beginning to end, I will believe you. Deny them, Dorian, deny them. Can't you see what I'm going through? My God, don't tell me that you're infamous. Dorian Gray smiled. There was a curl of contempt on his lips. Come upstairs, Basil, he said quietly. I keep a diary of my life from day to day, and it never leaves the room in which it's written. I will show it to you if you come with me. I will come with you, Dorian, if you wish it. I see that I've missed my train. It makes no matter. I can go tomorrow. But don't ask me to read anything tonight. All I want is a plain answer to my questions. That will be given to you upstairs. I could not give it here. You won't have to read long. Don't keep me waiting. So, we're coming to a bit of a head now. Obviously, Basil, despite believing the best, has made the critical flaw of judging Dorian based only on his physical appearance. And in the next chapter, we'll see the consequences of that. But as of right now, I hope you're warm. I hope you get some rest. And I'll see you next time.